Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, and the Apostle Paul writing from the New King James here version. And it says this, Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. So he's picking up from what he was talking about in the last chapter. He ended the chapter by saying this. He said, we wanted to come back to you to preach to you time and again, but Satan hindered us. Satan hindered us. He said, just because we haven't come, don't get the idea that we don't care about you, love you, long to be with you. He said, you're our joy. You're our crown. He said up here, you're, you're our hope. And he said, don't you know our motivation, our, the greatest value and reward that we're looking for out of life is to see you in the presence of the Lord Jesus and not in hell, but with the Lord Jesus. And so he's now picking that back up and saying, and even though we didn't come to you, we couldn't, couldn't come, we still sent Timothy, our brother, to establish you. So even though we couldn't personally come, we didn't do nothing. We sent Timothy to minister to you, to establish you, to teach you, to further uh to further clarify how God works and how God sees us and how to live for God and how to well, fellowship with God. He said, we wanted to continue discipling you. So I sent Timothy, which of course was a very beloved son, spiritual son of Paul. But he goes on to say, uh, verse three, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. And he's saying the things that have happened to us, the afflictions and such, the things that Satan has done, he said, nobody should be shaken by these afflictions. Don't let that bother you at all. It's just part of preaching the gospel that Satan resists you. He attacks you. You're going to go through things. In fact, I love what Paul told Timothy. He said, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. That's not, that's not just apostles, preachers, pastors. Everybody, if you desire to really live godly, people are going to look at you like, why do you talk like that? Why, why don't you don't even cuss? Like, why, why do you do this? Why don't you do that? Why don't you, you know, whatever. Maybe a person goes out and somebody says, hey, have a beer. And they say, no, I, I don't want to do that. And they're trying to walk for the Lord in a very uh, circumspect way to minister to people. And he's saying, look, they're going to suffer persecutions, okay? So here he's saying, don't be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. Not appointed to afflictions, but we're appointed to the gospel, which drums up spiritual resistance and therefore natural resistance. And by the way, uh, you may remember in the book of Acts when Paul was originally, you know, he was confronted by the Lord on the road to Damascus, and then he was blinded in his eyes, led into the city. And the Lord spoke to a man named Ananias and told him, a disciple, go and you're going to uh, lay hands on Paul that he may receive his sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, but he told Ananias, but you need to go and talk to him for I want to show him how many things he must suffer for my name. From day one, when Paul got saved, the Lord wanted to tell him how many things he's going to suffer. Paul, uh, the, the Lord Jesus, it's in red letters to Ananias in the book of Acts. The Lord Jesus said to, to Ananias, he said, I want to tell him right up front that he's a chosen vessel of mine. Like, yes, he's coming to faith and such. This is not just about his eternal life. I have chosen him 
to use him to go to the Gentiles and to get the gospel to, I mean, multiplied millions of people, really, eventually. But he said, but I want to show him what it's going to cost him in suffering and the persecution that's going to come against him. And of course, Paul, he showed Paul, and Paul said, I'm willing to do it, that people might know the Lord, that people might be saved. And so Paul said, you know, we were appointed to this. Paul said, I knew what I was signing up for because the Lord showed me right up front that it was going to be a life of suffering to be able to get the gospel to people. How precious is that to the Lord and to us? And so notice this, for in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it, is, just as it happened. And you know, uh, verse 5, for this reason, when, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. Oh, now Paul reveals another motivation. I didn't only send Timothy to teach you, to guide you, to further clarify the life in the kingdom. See, they didn't, they didn't have just Bibles read, readily available. Some of these people may not even, even had an Old Testament scroll. Maybe they did. I would think in most cases they were able to have access to it, but nobody had Bibles to carry around, and they certainly did not have the New Testament. So Paul was orally giving them the principles of the New Covenant See, and so he, he said, I sent Timothy, but now he said, I had a, another motivation too. He said, I not only was sending him because I wanted him to further clarify with you. He said, but I had a concern that the tempter, this is the devil, that he had somehow slipped in and was slipping in with, with lies and deceptions and false doctrines and such. And that by the time I got back around, because I've been hindered now, by the time I got back to you, you would have already turned to idols or some other belief or religion that was false. And he said, so I sent Timothy, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. All the work we had done, all the time we spent with you, that that may all be in vain, all be a waste of time. So he said, that's another reason I sent Timothy. Verse six, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning uh, you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Oh, this is just a beautiful thing that Paul is explaining here. Paul is saying, oh, I was very concerned that maybe all the work we did of discipling you was in vain because the tempter tempted you to abandon those truths and to embrace false truths and lies. He said, but now that Timothy has come, oh, he said, and he not only shared with us about your faith, about your love, about the the way you live your life for the Lord and for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying he also shared with us how you long to see us and you miss us and you look forward to us coming back, Paul himself and his companions coming back to minister to us. And Paul said, uh, that was so comforting to my heart that you have that affection for us. He, he's saying, I have that affection for you, but to hear that you miss us teaching you and you miss us being there and you long for us to come back. He said that that was so comforting and meaningful to us. And then he says this little verse here, verse eight, for now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Now we live if you stand fast. So he said, now that I've heard that you're standing fast in the Lord, oh, that makes me want to stand up and live. This is what I live for. It, that gives, you know, uh, breath to my lungs, that the wind beneath my wings, to know that you're standing fast in the Lord. See, the heart of Paul for these people, not just to complete his assignment, well, I did my job, whatever they do with it, that's their, you know, that's their problem. No, he wasn't like that. He didn't just want to do his job. He wanted to make sure that he gets them all the way to heaven. He gets them all the way through uh, their life and fulfilling their assignments and such. It's really a precious motivation. Verse 9, for what 
thanks can we render to God for you for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect, or that word can also be translated complete, and perfect or complete what is lacking in your faith. So he's saying, we rejoice uh, and we've been praying night and day because we do want to come back and see your face so that we can complete the discipleship. We can get you, you know, even further down the road with your understanding, your belief, your life, uh, your calling and such. Verse 11, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. May God direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. Blameless in holiness. What is holiness? Holiness is when uh, you have a life of purity, sinlessness, obedience, dedication and devotion to the Lord. You're not compromising with the sins of the world and such. You're holy because God is holy. See, so, and he said, blameless and holiness. Holiness is living right, like God lives, like he talks, like he acts. Blameless is when you act that holiness out and the way you interface with people, people look at you and say, wow, that person, you can't blame them because look at the way they live, look at the way they, their motivations, look at how they treat people. And so now you're not blamed for things. And that's, he's not trying to get out of blame, but so that our gospel, so that our ministry is not discounted, it's important to live a life that would be blameless. And so, by the way, people can live holy and yet do things that would make other people misunderstand that holiness. And so Paul said, also try to be blameless, blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So blameless in holiness. And notice he's saying not before people, but before the Lord when the Lord Jesus comes back.